Section four of Orientations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lady Franda. Orientations by W. Somerset Maugham. Section four. The Amicitia. They were walking home from the theatre. Well, Mr. White, said Valentia. I think it was just fine. It was magnificent, replied Mr. White. And they were separated for a moment by the crowd streaming up from the front say towards the opera and the boulevards. I think, if you don't mind, she said, I'll take your arm so that we shouldn't get lost. He gave her his arm, and they walked through the Louvre and over the river on the way to the Latin Quarter. Valentia was an art student, and Ferdinand White was a poet. Ferdinand considered Valentia the only woman who had ever been able to paint. Valentia told Ferdinand that he was the only man she had met who knew anything about art without being himself an artist. On her arrival in Paris a year before, she had immediately inscribed herself at the offices of the New York Herald, Valentia Stewart, Cincinnati, Ohio, USA. She settled down in a respectable pension, and within a week was painting vigorously. Ferdinand White arrived from Oxford at about the same time, hired a dirty room in a shabby hotel, ate his meals at cheap restaurants in the Boulevard Saint-Michel, read Stephen Mallarmé, and flattered himself that he was leasing La Vie de Bohème. After two months, the fates brought the pair together, and Ferdinand began to take his meals at Valencia's pension. They went to the museums together, and in the sculpture gallery at the Louvre. Ferdinand would discourse on ancient Greece in general and on Plato in particular, while among the pictures Valentia would lecture on tongues and values and chiaroscuro. Ferdinand renounced Ruskin and all his works. Valentia read the Symposium. Frequently in the evening they went to the theatre, sometimes to the Francais, but more often to the Odeon and after the performance they would discuss the play its art its technique above all its ethics ferdinand explained the piece he had in contemplation and valentia talked of the picture she meant to paint for next year's salon and the lady told her friends that her companion was the cleverest man she had met in her life while he told his that she was the only really sympathetic and intelligent girl he had ever known Thus were united in bonds of amity, Great Britain on the one side, and the United States of America and Ireland on the other. But when Ferdinand spoke of Valentia to the few Frenchmen he knew, they asked him, But this Miss Stewart, is she pretty? Certainly, in her American way, a long face, with the hair parted in the middle and hanging over the nape of the neck. Her mouth is quite classic. And have you never kissed the classic mouth? i never has she a good figure admirable and yet oh you english and they smiled and shrugged their shoulders and they said how english but my good fellow cried ferdinand in execrable french you don't understand we are friends the best of friends they shrugged their shoulders more despairingly than ever they stood on the bridge and looked at the water and the dark masses of the houses on the latin side with the twin towers of notre dame rising dimly behind them ferdinand thought of the thames at night with the barges gliding slowly down and the twinkling of the lights along the embankment it must be a little like that in holland she said but without the lights and with greater stillness when do you start she had been making preparations for spending the summer in a little village near amsterdam to paint i can't go now cried Valentia. Corrie Sales is going home, and there's no one else I can go with, and I can't go alone. Where are you going? I? I have no plans. I never make plans. They paused, looking at the reflections in the water. Then she said, I don't see why you shouldn't come to Holland with me. He did not know what to think. He knew she had been reading the symposium. After all, she said, there's no reason why one shouldn't go away with a man as well as with a woman. His French friends would have suggested that there were many reasons why one should go away with a woman rather than a man, 
but like his companion ferdinand looked at it in the light of pure friendship when one comes to think of it i really don't see why we shouldn't and the mere fact of staying at the same hotel can make no difference to either of us we shall both have our work you your painting and i my play as they considered it the idea was distinctly pleasing they wondered that it had not occurred to them before sauntering homewards they discussed the details and in half an hour had decided on the plan of their journey the date and the train next day valentia went to say good-bye to the old french painter whom all the american girls called popper she found him in a capacious dressing-gown smoking cigarettes well my dear he said what news i'm going to holland to paint windmills a very laudable ambition with your mother my good papa my mother's in cincinnati i'm going with mr white with mr white he raised his eyebrows you're very frank about it why what do you mean he put on his glasses and looked at her carefully does it not seem to you a rather curious thing for a young girl of your age to go away with a young man of the age of mr ferdinand white good gracious me one would think i was doing something that had never been done before oh many a young man has gone travelling with a young woman but they generally start by a night train and arrive at the station in different caps but surely papa you don't mean to insinuate mr white and i are going to holland as friends friends he looked at her more curiously than ever one can have a male friend as well as a girl friend she continued and i don't see why he shouldn't be just as good a friend the danger is that they become too good you misunderstand me entirely papa we are friends and nothing but friends you're entirely off your head my child ah you're a frenchman you can't understand these things we are different i imagine that you are human beings even though england and america respectively had the intense good fortune of seeing your birth we're human beings and more than that we're nineteenth-century human beings love is not everything it is a part of one perhaps the lower part an accessory to man's life needful for the continuation of the species you use such difficult words my dear there is something higher and nobler and purer than love there is friendship ferdinand white is my friend i have the amplest confidence in him i am certain that no unclean thought has ever entered his head she spoke quite heatedly and as she flushed up the old painter thought her astonishingly handsome then she added as an afterthought we despise passion passion is ugly it is grotesque the painter stripped his imperial and faintly smiled my child you must permit me to tell you that you are foolish passion is the most lovely thing in the world without it we should not paint beautiful pictures it is passion that makes a woman of a society lady it is passion that makes a man even of an art critic we do not want it she said we worship venus urania we are all spirit and soul you have been reading plato soon you will read zola he smiled again and lit another cigarette do you disapprove of my going she asked after a little silence he paused and looked at her then he shrugged his shoulders on the contrary i prove it is foolish but that is no reason why you should not do it after all folly is the great attribute of man no judge is as grave as an owl no soldier fighting for his country flies as rapidly as the hare you may be strong but you are not so strong as a horse you may be gluttonous but you cannot eat like a boa constrictor but there is no beast that can be as foolish as man and since one should always do what one can do best be foolish strive for folly above all things let the height of your ambition be the pointed cap with golden bells so bon voyage i will come and see you off to-morrow the painter arrived at the station with a box of sweets which he handed to valentia with a smile he shook ferdinand's hand warmly and muttered under his breath silly fool he's thinking of friendship too then as the train steamed out he waved his hand and cried be foolish be foolish he walked slowly out of the station and sat down at a cafe he lit a cigarette and sipping his absence said imbeciles 
They arrived at Amsterdam in the evening, and after dinner gathered together their belongings and crossed the A as the moon shone over the waters. Then they got into the little steam tram and started for Monikadam. They stood side by side on the platform of the carriage and watched the broad meadows bathed in the moonlight, the formless shapes of the cattle lying on the grass, and the black outlines of the mules. They passed by a long sleeping canal, and they stopped at little silent villages. At last they entered the dead town, and the tram put them down at the hotel door. Next morning, when she was half-dressed, Valentia threw open the window of her room and looked out into the garden. Ferdinand was walking about, dressed as befitted the place and season, in flannels, with a huge white hat on his hat. She could not help thinking him very handsome, and she took off the blue skirt she had intended to work in and put on a dress of muslin, all bespattered with coloured flowers, and she took in her hands a flat straw hat with red ribbons. "'You look like a Dresden shepherdess,' he said, as they met. They had breakfast in the garden beneath the trees, and as she poured out his tea, she laughed, and with the American accent which he was beginning to think made English so harmonious that, I reckon this about takes the shy out of Paris. They agreed to start work at once, losing no time, for they wanted to have a lot to show on their return to France, that their scheme might justify itself. Ferdinand wished to accompany Valentia on her search for the picturesque, but she would not let him. So, after breakfast, he sat himself down in the summer-house and spread out all round him his nice white paper, lit his pipe, cut his quills, and proceeded to the evolution of a masterpiece. Valentia tied the red strings of her sun-bonnet under her chin, selected a sketchbook, and sallied forth. At luncheon they met, and Valentia told of a little bit of canal with an old windmill on one side of it, which she had decided to paint, while Ferdinand announced that he had settled on the names of his dramatis personae. In the afternoon they returned to their work, and at night, tired with the previous day's travelling, went to bed soon after dinner. So they passed the second day, and the third day, and the fourth, till the end of the week came, and they had worked diligently. They were both of them rather surprised at the ease with which they became accustomed to their life. How absurd all these fusses, said Valentia, that people make about the differences with sexes. I'm sure it is only habit. We have ourselves to prove that there is nothing in it, he replied. You know, it is an interesting experiment that we are making. She had not looked at it in that light before. Perhaps it is. We may be the forerunners of a new era, the editors of a new communion. I shall write and tell Monsieur Rollo all about it. In the course of the letter, she said, sex is a morbid instinct. Out here, in the calmness of the canal and the broad meadows, it never enters one's head. I do not think of Ferdinand as a man. She looked up at him as she wrote the words, he was reading a book, and she saw him in profile, with the hat bent down. Through the leaves the sun lit up his face with a soft light that was almost green, and it occurred to her that it would be interesting to paint him. I do not think of Ferdinand as a man. To me he is a companion. He has a wider experience than a woman, and he talks of different things. Otherwise I see no difference. On his part, the idea of my sex never occurs to him, and far from being annoyed as an ordinary woman might be, I am proud of it. It shows me that when I chose a companion, I chose well. To him, I am not a woman. I am a man. And she finished with the repetition of Ferdinand's remark. We are the Edisons of a new communion. When Valencia began to paint her companion's portrait, they were naturally much more together. They never grew tired of sitting in the pleasant garden under the trees while she worked at her canvas and green shadows fell on the profile of Ferdinand White. They talked of many things. After a while, they became less reserved about their private concerns. Valencia told Ferdinand about her home in Ohio and about her people, and Ferdinand spoke of the country parsonage in which he had spent his childhood in the public school and lastly of Oxford and the strange happy days when he had learned to read Plato in water painter. At last Valencia threw aside her brushes and leaned back with a sigh. It is finished. 
Ferdinand rose and stretched himself and went to look at his portrait. He stood before it for a while, and then he placed his hand on Valencia's shoulder. You are a genius, Miss Stewart. She looked up at him. Ah, Mr. White, I was inspired by you. It is more your work than mine. In the evening they went out for a stroll. They wandered through the silent street. In the darkness they lost the quaintness of the red brick houses, contrasting with the bright yellow of the paving. But it was even quieter than by day. The street was very broad, and it wound about from east to west and from west to east, and at last it took them to the tiny harbour. Two fishing smacks were basking in the water, moored to the side, and the shelter shade was covered with the innumerable reflections of the stars. On one of the boats a man was sitting at the prow, fishing, and now and then through the darkness one saw the red glow of his pipe. By his side, huddled up on the sail, lay a sleeping boy. The other boat seemed deserted. Ferdinand and Valencia stood for a long time watching the fisher, and he was so still that they wondered whether he too were sleeping. They looked across the sea, and in the distance saw the dim lights of Marken, the island of fishers. They wandered on again through the street, and now the lights in the windows were extinguished one by one, and sleep came over the town. And the quietness was even greater than before. They walked on, and their footsteps made no sound. They felt themselves alone in the dead city, and they did not speak. At length they came to a canal gliding towards the sea. They followed it inland, and here the darkness was equal to the silence. Great trees that had been planted when William of Orange was king in England threw their shades over the water, shutting out the stars. They wandered along on the soft earth, they could not hear themselves walk, and they did not speak. They came to a bridge over the canal and stood on it, looking at the water and the trees above them, and the water in the trees below them, and they did not speak. Then, out of the darkness came another darkness, and gradually loomed forth the heaviness of a barge. Noiselessly it glided down the stream, very slowly, at the end of it the boy stood at the tiller, steering, and it passed beneath them and beyond, till it lost itself in the night and again they were alone. They stood side by side, leaning against the parapet, looking down in the water, and from the water rose up love, and love fluttered down from the trees and love was born alone upon the night air ferdinand did not know what was happening to him he fell valentia by his side and he drew closer to her till her dress touched his legs and the silk of her sleeve rubbed against his arm it was so dark that he could not see her face he wondered of what she was thinking she made a little movement and to him came a faint wave of the sand she wore Presently, two forms passed by on the bank, and they saw a lover with his arm round a girl's waist, and then they two were hidden in the darkness. Ferdinand trembled as he spoke. Only love is waking. And we, she said, and you. He wondered why she said nothing. Did she understand? He put his hand on her arm. Valentia. He had never called her by her Christian name before. She turned her face towards him. What do you mean? Oh, Valencia, I love you. I can't help it. A sob burst from her. Didn't you understand, he said, all those hours that I set for you while you painted, and these long nights in which we wandered by the water? I thought you were my friend. I thought so, too. When I sat before you and watched you paint, and looked at your beautiful hair and your eyes, I thought I was your friend. And I looked at the lines of your body beneath your dress, and when it pleased me to carry your easel and walk with you, I thought it was friendship. Only tonight I know I'm in love. Oh, Valencia, I'm so glad. She could not keep back her tears. Her bosom heaved and she wept. You are a woman, he said. Did you not see? I am so sorry, she said, her voice all broken. I thought we were such good friends. I was so happy, and now you have spoiled it all. Valencia, I love you. I thought our French was so good and pure, and I felt so strong in it. It seemed to me so beautiful. 
Do you think I was less a man than the fisherman you see walking beneath the trees at night? It is all over now, she sighed. What do you mean? I can't stay here with you alone. You're not going away. Before, there was no harm in our being together at the hotel, but now... Oh, Valentia, don't leave me. I can't... I can't live without you. She heard the unhappiness in his voice. She turned to him again and laid her two hands on his shoulders. Why can't you forget it all? Let us be good friends again. Forget that you are a man. A woman can remain with a man forever and always be content to walk and read and talk with him and never think of anything else. Can you forget it, Ferdinand? You will make me so happy. He did not answer, and for a long time they stood on the bridge in silence. At last he sighed, a heart-breaking sigh. Perhaps you're right. It may be better to pretend that we are friends. If you like, we will forget all this. Her heart was too full. She could not answer, but she held out her hands to him. He took them in his own, and bending down, kissed them. Then they walked home, side by side, without speaking. Next morning, Valencia received Monsieur Rollo's answer to her letter. He apologized for his delay in answering. You are a philosopher, he said. She could see the little snigger with which he had written the words. You are a philosopher, and I was afraid lest my reply should disturb the course of your reflections on friendship. I confess that I did not entirely understand your letter, but I gathered that the sentiments were correct, and it gave me great pleasure to know that your experiment has had such excellent results. I gather that you have not yet discovered that there is more than a verbal connection between friendship and love. The reference is to the French equivalents of those states of mind. But to speak seriously, dear child, you are young and beautiful now, but not so very many years shall pass before your lovely skin becomes coarse and muddy, and your teeth yellow, and the wrinkles appear about your mouth and eyes, and you have not so very many years before you in which to collect sensations, and the recollection of one's loves is perhaps the greatest pleasure left to one's old age. To be virtuous, my dear, is admirable, but there are so many interpretations of virtue. For myself, I can say that I have never regretted the temptations to which I succumbed, but often the temptations I have resisted. Therefore, love, love, love. I remember that if love is sixty in a man is sometimes pathetic, and a woman at forty it is always ridiculous. Therefore, take your youth in both hands and say to yourself, Life is short but let me live before I die. She did not show the letter to Ferdinand. Next day it rained. Valencia retired to a room at the top of the house and began to paint, but the incessant patter on the roof got on her nerves. The painting bored her, and she threw aside the brushes in disgust. She came downstairs and found Ferdinand in the dining room, standing at the window, looking at the rain. It came down in one continual steady pour, and the water ran off the raised brick wood, off the middle of the street to the gutters by the side, running along in a swift and murky rivulet. The red brick of the opposite house looked cold and cheerless in the wet. He did not turn or speak to her as she came in. She remarked that it did not look like leaving off. He made no answer. She drew a chair to the second window and tried to read. But she could not understand what she was reading, and she looked out at the pouring ring and the red brick house opposite. She wondered why he had not answered. The innkeeper brought them their luncheon. Ferdinand took no notice of the preparations. Will you come to luncheon, Mr. White? She said to him. It's quite ready. I beg your pardon, he said gravely, as he took his seat. He looked at her quickly, and then immediately dropping his eyes began eating. She wished he would not look so sad. She was very sorry for him. She made an observation and he appeared to rouse himself. He replied and they began talking, very calmly and coldly, as if they had not known one another five minutes. They talked of art with the biggest of A's and they compared Dutch paintings with Italian. They spoke of Rembrandt and his life. Rembrandt had passion, said Ferdinand, bitterly, and therefore he was unhappy. 
it is only the sexless passionless creature the block of eyes that can be happy in this world she blushed and did not answer the afternoon valentia spent in her room pretending to write letters and she wondered whether ferdinand was wishing her downstairs at dinner they sought refuge in abstractions they talked of dykes and windmills and cigars the history of holland and its constitution the constitution of the united states and the edifying spectacle of the politics of that blessed country they talked of political economy pessimism and cattle-rearing the state of agriculture in england the foreign policy of the day anarchism the president of the french republic they would have talked of bimetallism if they could people hearing them would have thought them very learned and extraordinarily staid at last they separated and as she undressed valentia told herself that ferdinand had kept his promise everything was just as it had been before and the only change was that he used her christian name and she rather liked him to call her valentia but next day ferdinand did not seem able to command himself when valentia addressed him he answered in monosyllables with eyes averted but when she had her back turned she felt that he was looking at her after breakfast she went away painting haystacks and was late for luncheon she apologized it is of no consequence he said keeping his eyes on the ground and those were the only words he spoke to her during the remainder of the day once when he was looking at her surreptitiously and she suddenly turned round their eyes met for a moment he gazed straight at her then walked away she wished he would not look so sad as she was going to bed she held out her hand to him to say good night and she added i don't want to make you unhappy mr white i'm very sorry it's not your fault he said you can't help it if you are stuck in a stone he went away without taking the proffered hand valentia cried that night in the morning she found a note outside her door pardon me if i was rude but i was not master of myself i am going to volendam i hate monikadam ferdinand arrived at volendam it was a fishing village only three miles across country from monikadam but the route by steam tram and canal was so circuitous that with luggage it took one two hours to get from place to place he had walked over there with valentia and had almost tempted them to desert monikadam ferdinand took a room at the hotel and walked out trying to distract himself the village consisted of a couple of score of houses built round a semicircular dike against the sea and near the semicircle lay the fleet of fishing boats men and women were sitting at their doors mending nets he looked at the fishermen great sturdy fellows with rough weather-beaten faces huge earrings dangling from their ears he took note of their quaint costume black stockings and breeches the latter more baggy than a turk's and the crushed strawberry of their high jackets cut close to the body he remembered how he had looked at them with valentia and the group of boys and men that she had sketched he remembered how they walked along peeping into the houses where everything was spick and span as only a dutch cottage can be with old delved plates hanging on the walls and pots and pans of polished brass and he looked over the sea to the island of marken with its masts crowded together like forest without leaf or branch coming to the end of the little town he saw the church of monacadam the red steeple half hidden by the trees he wondered where valentia was what she was doing but he turned back resolutely and going to his room opened his books and began reading he rubbed his eyes and frowned in order to fix his attention but the book said nothing but valentia at last he threw it aside and took his plato in his dictionary commencing to translate a difficult passage word for word but whenever he looked up a word he could only see valentia and he could not make hat or tail of the greek he threw it aside also and set out walking he walked as hard as he could away from monica then the second day was not quite so difficult and he read till his mind was dazed and then he wrote letters home and told them he was enjoying himself tremendously and he walked till he felt his legs dropping off the next morning it occurred to him that valentia might have written trembling with excitement 
he watched the postman coming down the street but he had no letter for ferdinand there would be no more post that day but the next day ferdinand felt sure there would be a letter for him the postman passed by the hotel door without stopping ferdinand thought he should go mad all day he walked up and down his room thinking only of valencia why did she not write the night fell and he could see from his window the moon shining over the clump of trees about monica dam church he could stand it no longer he put on his hat and walked across country the three miles were endless the church and the trees seemed to grow no nearer and at last when he thought himself close he found it at bay to walk round and appeared further away than ever he came to the mouth of the canal along which he and valencia had so often walked he looked about but he could see no one his heart beat as he approached the little bridge but valencia was not there of course she would not come out alone he ran to the hotel and asked for her they told him she was not in he walked through the town not a soul was to be seen he came to the church he walked round and then right at the edge of the trees he saw a figure sitting on a bench she was dressed in the same flowered dress which she had worn when he likened her to a dresden shepherdess she was looking towards valenden he went up to her silently she sprang up with a little shriek ferdinand oh valencia i cannot help it i could not remain away any longer i could do nothing but think of you all day all night if you knew how i loved you oh valencia have pity on me i cannot be your friend it's all nonsense about friendship i hate it i can only love you i love you with all my heart and soul valencia she was frightened oh how can you stand there so coldly and watch me in my agony don't you see how can you be so cold i am not cold ferdinand she said trembling do you think i have been happy while you were away valencia i thought for you too ferdinand all day all night and i longed for you to come back i did not know to you when that i loved you oh valencia he took her in his arms and pressed her passionately to him no for god's sake she tore herself away but again he took her in his arms and this time he kissed her on the mouth she tried to turn her face away i shall kill myself ferdinand what do you mean in those long hours that i sat here looking towards you i felt i loved you i loved you as passionately as you said you loved me but if you came back and anything happened i swore that i would throw myself in the canal he looked at her i could not leave afterwards she said hoarsely it would be too horrible i should be oh i can't think of it he took her in his arms again and kissed her have mercy on me she cried you love me valencia oh it is nothing to you afterwards you will be just as the same as before why cannot men love peacefully like women i should be so happy to remain always as we are now and never change i tell you i shall kill myself i will do as you do valencia you if anything happens valencia he said gravely we will go down to the canal together she was horrified at the idea but it fascinated her i should like to die in your arms she said for the second time he bent down and took her hands and kissed them then she went alone into the silent church and prayed they went home ferdinand was so pleased to be at the hotel again near her his bed seemed so comfortable he was so happy and he slept dreaming of valencia the following nights they went for their walk arm in arm and they came to the canal from the bridge they looked at the water it was very dark they could not hear it flow no stars were reflected in it and the trees by its side made the death seem endless valencia shuddered perhaps in a little while their bodies would be lying deep down in the water and they would be in one another's arms and they would never be separated oh what a price it was to pay she looked tearfully at ferdinand but he was looking down at the darkness beneath them and he was intensely grave 
and they wandered there by day and looked at the black reflection of the trees and in the heat it seemed so cool and restful they abandoned their work what did pictures and books matter now they sauntered about the meadows along shady roads they watched the black and white cows sleepily browsing sometimes coming to the water's edge to drink looking at themselves amazed they saw the huge limbs milkmaids come along with their little stools and the pails deftly tying the cow's hind legs that it might not kick and the steaming milk frothed into the pails and was poured into huge barrels and as each cow was freed she took herself a little and recommenced to browse they loved their life as they had never loved it before one evening they went again to the canal and looked at the water but it seemed to have lost their emotions before it they were no longer afraid ferdinand sat on the parapets and valencia leaned against him he bent his head so that his face might touch her hair she looked at him and smiled and she almost lifted her lips he kissed them do you love me ferdinand he gave the answer without words their faces were touching now and he was holding her hands they were both very happy you know ferdinand she whispered we are very foolish i don't care monsieur rollo said that folly was the chief attribute of man what did he say of love i forget then after a pause he whispered in her ear i love you and she held up her lips to him again after all she said we are only human beings we can't help it i think she hesitated what she was going to say had something of the anticlimax in it i think it would be very silly if if we threw ourselves in the horrid canal valencia do you mean she smiled charmingly as she answered what to you ferdinand again he took both her hands and bending down kissed them but this time she lifted him up to her and kissed him on the lips one night after dinner i told this story to my aunt but why on earth didn't they get married she asked when i had finished good heavens i cried and never occurred to me well i think they ought she said oh i have no doubt they did i expect they got on their bikes and rode off to the consulate in amsterdam then then i'm sure it would have been his first thought of course some girls are very queer said my aunt End of section four. Section five of Orientations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lily Brenda. Orientations by w somerset mom section five faith the moon shone fitfully through the clouds on to the weary face of brother jasper kneeling in his cell his hands were fervently clasped uplifted to the crucifix that hung on the bare wall and he was praying praying as he had never prayed before all through the hours of night while the monks were sleeping brother jasper had been supplicating his god for light but in his soul remained a darkness deeper than that of the blackest night at last he heard the tinkling of the bell that called the monks to prayers and with a groan lifted himself up he opened his cell door and went out into the cloister with downturned face he walked along till he came to the chapel and reaching his seat sank again heavily to his knees the lights in the chapel were few enough for saint lucido was nearly the poorest monastery in spain a few dim candles on the altar threw long shadows on the pavement and in the choir the yellow glare lit up uncouthly the pale faces of the monks when brother jasper stood up the taper at his back cast an unnatural light over him like a halo making his great black eyes shine strangely from the deep sockets while below them the dark lines and black shadows of his shaven chin gave him an unearthly weirdness he looked like a living corpse standing in the brown franciscan cowl 
a dead monk doomed for some sin to wander through the earth till the day the day of judgment and in the agony of that weary face one could almost read the terrors of eternal death the monks recite to the surface with their heavy drone and the sound of the harsh men's voices ascended to the vault dragging along the roof but jasper heard not what they said he rose and knelt as they did he uttered the words he walked out of the church in his turn and through the cloister to his cell and he threw himself on the floor and beat his hat against the hard stones weeping passionately and he cried out what shall i do what shall i do for brother jasper did not believe two days before the monk standing amid the stunted shrubs on the hill of san lucido had looked out on the arid plain before him it was all brown and grey the desolate ground strewed with huge granite boulders treeless and for the wretched sheep who fed there thin and scanty grass the shepherd in his tattered cloak sat on a rock moodily paying no heed to his flock dully looking at the desert round him brother jasper gazed at the scene as he had gazed for three years since he had come to san lucido filled with faith and great love for god in those days he had thought nothing of the cold waste as his eyes rested on it the light of heaven shed a wonderful glow on the scene and when at sunset the heavy clouds were piled one above the other like huge fantastic mountains turned into golden fire when he looked beyond them and saw the whole sky burning red and then a mass of yellow and gold he could imagine that god was sitting there on his throne of fire with christ on his right hand in ropes of light and glory and mary the queen on his left and above them the dove with his outstretched wings the white bird hovering in a sea of light and it seemed so near brother jasper felt in him almost the power to go there to climb up those massy clouds of fire and attain the great joy the joy of the presence of god the sun sank slowly the red darkened into purple and over the whole sky came a colour of indescribable softness while in the east very far away shone out a star and soon the soft faint blue sank before the night and the stars in the sky were countless but still in the west there was the shadow of the sun a misty gleam over the rocky plain the heavens seemed so great so high that brother jasper sank down in his insignificance yet he remembered the glories of the sunset and felt that he was almost at the feet of god but now when he looked at the clouds and the sun behind them he saw no god he saw the desert plain the barrenness of the earth the overladen wretched donkey staggering under his pannier and the broad-headed peasant urging him on he looked at the sunset and tried to imagine the trinity that sat there but he saw nothing and he asked himself why should there be a god he started up with a cry of terror with his hands clasped to his head my god what have i done he sank to his knees humiliating himself what vengeance would fall on him he prayed passionately but again the thought came he shrieked with terror he invoked the mother of god to help him why should there be a god he could not help it the thought would not leave him that all this might exist without how did he know how could any one be sure quite sure but he drove the thoughts away and in his cell imposed upon himself a penance it was satan that stood whispering in his ear satan lying in wait for his soul let him deny god and he would be damned for ever he prayed with all his strength he argued with himself he cried out i believe i believe but in his soul was the doubt the terror made him tremble like a leaf in the wind and great drops of sweat stood on his forehead and ran heavily down his cheek he beat his hat against the wall and in his agony swayed from side to side but he could not believe and for two days he had endured the torments of hell-fire battling against himself in vain the heavy lines beneath his eyes grew blacker than the night his lips were pale with agony and fasting 
he had not dared to speak to anyone he could not tell them and in him was the impulse to shout out why should there be now he could bear it no longer in the morning he went to the prior's cell and falling on his knees buried his face in the old man's lap oh father help me help me the prior was old and wasted for fifty years he had lived in the desert castilian plain in the little monastery all through his youth and manhood through his age and now he was older than any one at san lucido white-haired and wrinkled but with a clear rosy skin like a boy's his soft eyes had shone with light but a cataract had developed and gradually his sight had left him till he could barely see the crucifix in his cell and the fingers of his hand at last he could only see the light but the prior did not lose the beautiful serenity of his life he was always happy and kind and feeling that his death could not now be very distant he was filled with a heavenly joy that he would shortly see the face of god long hours he sat in his chair looking at the light with an indescribably charming smile hovering on his lips his voice broken by sobs brother jasper told his story while the prior gently stroked the young man's hands and face oh father make me believe one cannot force one's faith my dear it comes it goes and no man knows the wherefore faith does not come from reasoning it comes from god pray for it and rest in peace i want to believe so earnestly i am so unhappy you are not the only one who has been tried my son others have doubted before you and have been saved but if i died to-night i should die in mortal sin believe that god counts the attempt as worthy as the achievement oh pray for me father pray for me i cannot stand alone give me your strength go in peace my son i will pray for you and god will give you strength jasper went away day followed day and week followed week the spring came and the summer but there was no difference in the rocky desert of san lucido there were no trees to bud and burst into leaf no flowers to bloom and fade biting winds gave way to fiery heat the sun beat down on the plain and the sky was cloudless cloudless even the nights were so hot that the monks in their cells gasped for breath and brother jasper brooded over the faith that was dead and in his self-torment his cheeks became so hollow that the bones of his face seemed about to pierce the skin the flesh shrank from his hands and the fingers became long and thin like the claws of a vulture he used to spend long hours with the prior while the old man talked gently trying to bring faith to the poor monk that his soul might rest but one day in the midst of the speaking the prior stopped and jasper saw an expression of pain pass over his face what is it nothing my son he replied smiling we enter the world with pain and with pain we leave it what do you mean are you ill father father the prior opened his mouth and showed a great sloughing sore he put jasper's fingers to his neck and made him feel the enlarged and hardened glands what is it you must see a surgeon no surgeon can help me brother jasper it is cancer the crab it is the way that god has sent to call me to himself then the prior began to suffer the agonies of the disease terrible pains shot through his head and neck he could not swallow it was a slow starvation the torment kept him awake through night after night and only occasionally his very exhaustion gave him a little relief so that he slept thinner and thinner he became and his whole mouth was turned into a putrid horrible sore but yet he never murmured brother jasper knelt by his bed looking at him pitifully how can you suffer it all what have you done that god should give you this was it not enough that you were blind ah i saw such beautiful things after i became blind all heaven appeared before me it is unjust unjust my son all is just you drive me mad do you still believe in the merciful goodness of god a beautiful smile broke through the pain on the old man's face i still believe in the merciful goodness of god there was a silence 
Brother Jasper buried his face in his hands and thought brokenheartedly of his own affliction. How happy he could be if he had that faith! But the silence in the room was more than the silence of people who did not speak. Jasper looked up suddenly. The prior was dead. Then the monk bent over the body and looked at the face into the opaque white eyes. There was no difference. The flesh was warm. Everything was just the same. And yet, and yet he was dead. What did I mean by saying the soul had fled? What had happened? Jasper understood nothing of it. And afterwards, before the funeral, when he looked at the corpse again, and it was cold and a horrible blackness stained the lips, he felt sure. Brother Jasper could not believe in the resurrection of the dead. And the soul, what did he mean by the soul? Then a great loneliness came over him. The hours of his life seemed endless, and there was no one in whom he could find comfort. The prior had given him a ray of hope, but he was gone, and now Jasper was alone in the world, and beyond, oh, how could one be certain? It was awful, this perpetual doubt, recurring more strongly than ever. Men had believed so long. Think of all the beautiful churches that had been made in the honour of God, and the pictures. Think of the works that had been done for his love, the martyrs who had cheerfully given up their lives. It seemed impossible that it should be all for nothing. But, but Jasper could not believe, and he cried out to the soul of the prior, resting in heaven, to come to him and help him. Surely, if he really were alive again, he would not let the poor monk whom he had loved linger in this terrible uncertainty. Jasper redoubled his prayers. For hours he remained on his knees, imploring God to send him light. But no light came, and exhausted brother Jasper sank into despair. The new prior was a tall, gaunt man, with a great hooked nose and heavy lips. His keen dark eyes shone fiercely from beneath his shaggy brows. He was still young, full of passionate energy, and with large gesture and loud metallic voice he loved to speak of hell-fire and the pains of the damned, hating the Jews and heretics with a bitter personal hatred. To the stick, he used to say, the earth must be purged of this vermin and it must be purged by fire. He exacted the most absolute obedience from the monks, and pitiless was the punishment for any infringement of his rules. Brother Jasper feared the man with an almost unearthly terror. When he felt resting upon him the piercing black eyes, he trembled in his seat, and a cold sweat broke out over him. If the prior knew, the thought almost made him faint, and yet the fear of it seemed to drag him on, like a bird before a serpent. He was fascinated. Sometimes he felt sudden impulses to tell him, but the vengeful eyes terrified him. One day he was in the cloister, looking out at the little green plot in the middle where the monks were buried, wondering confusedly whether all that prayer and effort had been offered up to empty images of what? Of the fear of man? Turning round, he started back and his heart beat, for the prior was standing close by, looking at him with those horrible eyes. Brother Jasper trembled so that he could scarcely stand. He looked down. Brother Jasper. The prior's voice seemed sterner than it had ever been before. Brother Jasper. Father, what have you to tell me? Jasper looked up at him. The blood fled from his lips. Nothing, my father. The prior looked at him firmly and Jasper thought he read the inmost secrets of his heart. Speak, brother Jasper, said the prior, and his voice was loud and menacing. Then hurriedly, stuttering in his anxiety, the monk confessed his misery. A horror came over the prior's face as he listened, and Jasper became so terrified that he could hardly speak. But the prior seemed to recover himself and interrupted him with a furious burst of anger. You look over the plain and do not see God, and for that you doubt him, miserable fool. Oh, father, have mercy on me. I have tried so hard. I want to believe, but I cannot. I cannot, I cannot. What is that? Have men believed for a thousand years? Has God performed miracle after miracle? 
and a miserable monk dares to deny him i cannot believe you must his voice was so loud that it rang through the cloisters he seized jasper's clasped hands raised in supplication before him and forced him to his knees i tell you you shall believe quivering with wrath he looked at the prostrate form at his feet moved by convulsive weeping he raised his hand as if to strike the monk but with difficulty contained himself then the prior bade brother jasper go to the church and wait the monks were gathered together all astonished they stood in their usual places but jasper remained in the middle away from them with head cast down the prior called out to them in his loud clear voice pray my brethren pray for the soul of brother jasper which lies in peril of eternal death the monks looked at him suddenly and brother jasper's head sank lower so that no one could see his face the prior sank to his knees and prayed with savage fervour afterwards the monks went their ways but when jasper passed them they looked down and when by chance he addressed a novice the youth hurried from him without answering they looked upon him as accursed the prior spoke no more but often jasper felt his stern gaze resting on him and a shiver would pass through him in the surfaces jasper stood apart from the rest like an unclean thing he did not join in their prayers listening confusedly to the monotonous droning and when a pause came and he felt all eyes turned to him he put his hands to his face to hide himself pray my brethren pray for the soul of brother jasper which lies in peril of eternal death in his cell the monk would for days sit apathetically looking at the stone wall in front of him sore of heart the hours would pass by unnoticed and only the ringing of the chapel bell awoke him from his stupor and sometimes he would be seized with sudden passion and throwing himself on his knees pour forth a stream of eager vehement prayer he remembered the penances which the seraphic father imposed on his flesh but he always had faith and jasper would scourge himself till he felt sick and faint and hoping to gain his soul by mortification of the body refused the bread and water which was thrust into his cell and for a long while eat nothing he became so weak and ill that he could hardly stand and still no help came then he took it into his head that god would pity him and send a miracle to drive away his uncertainty was he not anxious to believe if only he could so anxious god would not send a miracle to a poor monk yet miracles had been performed for smaller folk than he for shepherds and tenders of swine but christ himself had said that miracles only came by faith but jasper remembered that often the profligates and the hallowed had been brought to repentance by a vision even the holy francis had been but a loose garland till christ appeared to him yet if christ had appeared it showed ah but how could one be sure it might only have been a dream let a vision appear to him and he would believe oh how enchanted he would be to believe to rest in peace to know that before him however hard the life were eternal joy and the kingdom of heaven but brother jasper put his hands to his head cruelly aching he could not understand he could not know the doubt waved on his brain like a sheet of lead he felt inclined to tear his gull apart to relieve the insupportable pressure how endless life was why could it not finish quickly and let him know but supposing there really was a god he would exact terrible vengeance what punishments would he inflict on the monk who had denied him who had betrayed him like a second judas then a fantastic idea came into his crazy brain was it satan that put all these doubts into his head if it were satan must exist and if he did god existed too he knew that the devil stood ready to appear to all who called if christ would not appear let satan show himself it meant hell-fire but if god were the monk felt he was damned already for the truth he would give his soul the idea sent a coldness through him so that he shivered but it possessed him and he exulted 
thinking that he would know at last he rose from his bed it was the dead of night and all the monks were sleeping and trembling with cold began to draw with chalk strange figures on the floor he had seen them long ago in an old book of magic and their fantastic shapes fascinating him had remained in his memory in the centre of the strange confusion of triangles he stood and uttered in a husky voice the invocation he murmured uncouth words in an unknown language and bade satan stand forth he expected a thunderclap the flashing of lightning sulphurous fumes but the knights remained silent and quiet not a sound broke the stillness of the monastery the snow outside fell steadily next day the prior sent for him and repeated his solemn question brother jasper what have you to say to me and absolutely despairing jasper answered nothing 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 then the prior strode up to him in wrath and smote him on the cheek it is a devil within you a devil of obstinacy and pride you shall believe he cried to the monks to lay hold of him they dragged him roughly to the cloisters and stripping him of his cowl tied it round his waist and bound him by the hands to a pillar and the prior ordered them to give jasper eight and thirty strokes with the scourge one less than christ that the devil might be driven out the scourge was heavy and knotted and the porter bared his arms that he might strike the better the mug stood round in eager expectation the scourge wheezed through the air and came down with a thud on jasper's bare shoulders a tremor passed through him but he did not speak again it came down and as the porter raised it for the third time the monk saw great bleeding wheels on brother jasper's back then as the scourge fell heavily a terrible groan burst from him the porter swung his arm and this time a shriek broke from the wretched monk the blows came pitilessly and jasper lost all courage he shrieked with agony imploring them to stop but ferociously the prior cried did christ bear in silence forty stripes save one and do you cry out like a woman before you have had ten the porter went on and the prior's words were interrupted by pins and shrieks it is the devil crying out within him said the monks gloating on the bleeding back and face of agony heavy drops of sweat ran off the porter's face and his arm began to tire but he seized the handle with both hands and swung the knotted ropes with all his strength jasper fainted see said the prior see the fate of him who has not faith in god the cords with which he was tied prevented the monk from falling and stroke after stroke fell on his back till the number was completed then they loosed him from the column and he sank senseless and bleeding to the ground they left him brother jasper regained slowly his senses lying out in the cold cloister with the snow on the graves in the middle his hands and feet were stiff and blue he shivered and drew himself together for warmth then a groan burst from him feeling the wounds of his back painfully he lifted himself up and crawled to the chapel door he pushed it open and staggering forward fell on his face looking towards the altar he remained there long dazed and weary pulling his cowl close round him to keep out the bitter cold the pain of his body almost relieved the pain of his mind he wished dumbly that he could lie there and die and be finished with it all he did not know the time he wondered whether any service would soon bring the monks to disturb him he took sad pleasure in the solitude and in the great church the solitude seemed more intense oh and he hated the monks it was cruel 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 he put his hands to his face and sobbed bitterly but suddenly a warmth fell on him he looked up and the glow seemed to come from the crucified christ in the great painted window by the altar the monk started up with a cry and looked eagerly the bell began to ring the green colour of death was becoming richer the glass gained the fullness of real flesh now it was a soft round whiteness and brother jasper cried out in ecstasy it is christ then the glow deepened 
and from the crucified one was shed a wonderful light like the rising of the sun behind the mountains and the church was filled with its rich effulgence oh god it is moving the christ seemed to look at brother jasper and bow his head two by two the monks walked silently in and brother jasper lifted up his arms crying behold a miracle christ has appeared to me a murmur of astonishment broke from them and they looked at jasper gazing in ecstasy at the painted window christ has appeared to me i am saved then the prior came up to him and took him in his arms and kissed him my son praise be to god you are whole again but jasper pushed him aside so that he might not be robbed of the sight which filled him with rapture the monks crowded round questioning but he took no notice of them he stood with outstretched arms looking eagerly his face lighted up with joy the monks began to kiss his cowl and his feet and they touched his hands i am saved i am saved and the prior cried to them praise god my brethren praise god for we have saved the soul of brother jasper from eternal death but when the service was over and the monks had filed out brother jasper came to himself and he saw that the light had gone from the window the christ was cold and dead a thing of the handicraft of man what was it that had happened had a miracle occurred the question flashing through his mind made him cry out he had prayed for a miracle and a miracle had been shown him the poor monk of saint lucido and now he doubted the miracle oh god must have ordained the damnation of his soul to give him so little strength perhaps he had sent the miracle that he might have no answer at the day of judgment faith thou hast not i showed myself to thee in flesh and blood i moved my head thou didst not believe thy own eyes next day at vespers jasper anxiously fixed his gaze on the stained glass window again a glow came from it and as he moved the hat seemed to imply itself but now jasper saw it was only the sun shining through the window only the sun then the heaviness descended into the deepest parts of jasper's soul and he despaired the night came and jasper returned to his cell he leaned against the door looking out through the little window but he could only see the darkness and he likened it to the darkness in his soul what shall i do he groaned he could not tell the monks that it was not a miracle he had seen he could not tell them that he had lost faith again and then his thoughts wandering to the future must i remain all my life in this cold monastery if there is no god if i have but one life what is the good of it why cannot i enjoy my short existence as other men am i not young am not i of the same flesh and blood as they vague recollections came to him of those new lands beyond the ocean those lands of sunshine and sweet odours his mind became filled with a vision of broad rivers running slow and cool overshadowed by strange luxuriant trees and all was a wealth of beautiful colour oh i cannot stay he cried i cannot stay and it was a land of loving kindness a land of soft-eyed gentle women i cannot stay i cannot stay the desire to go forth was overwhelming the walls of his cell seemed drawing together to crush him he must be free oh for life life he started up not seeing the madness of his adventure he did not think of the snow-covered desert the night the distance from a town he saw before him the glorious sunshine of a new life and he went towards it like a blind man with outstretched arms every one was asleep in the monastery he crept out of his cell and silently opened the door of the porter's lodge the porter was sleeping heavily jasper took the keys and unlocked the gate he was free he took no notice of the keen wind blowing across the desert he hurried down the hill sleeping on the frozen snow suddenly he stopped he had caught sight of the great crucifix which stood by the wayside at the bottom of the hill then the madness of it all occurred to him wherever he went 
he would find the crucifix even beyond the sea, and nowhere would he be able to forget his God, always the recollection, always the doubt, and he would never have rest till he was in the grave. He went close to it and looked up. It was one of those strange Spanish crucifixes, a wooden image with long, thin arms and legs and protruding ribs, with real hair hanging over the shoulders, and a true crown of thorns placed on the hat, the ends of the tattered cloth fastened about the loins fluttered in the wind. In the night, the lifelikeness was almost ghastly. It might have been a real man that hung there, with great nails through his feet. The common people paid superstitious reverence to it, and Jasper had often heard the peasants tell of the consolations they had received. Why should not he too receive consolation? Was his soul not as worth saving as theirs? A last spark of hope filled him, and he lifted himself up on tiptoe to touch the feet. O oh Christ, come down to me. Tell me whether thou art indeed a God. O oh Christ, help me. But the words lost themselves in the wind and night. Then a great rage seized him that he alone should receive no comfort. He clenched his fists and beat passionately against the cross. Oh, you are cruel God, I hate you, I hate you. If he could have wished it, he would have torn the image down and beat it as he had been bitten. In his impotent rage, he shrieked out curses upon it, he blasphemed. But his strength spanned itself and he sank to the foot of the cross, bursting into tears. In his self-pity, he thought his heart was broken. Lifting himself to his knees, he clasped the wood with his hands and looked up for the last time at the dead face of Christ. It was the end. A strange peace came over him as the anguish of his mind fell away before the cold. His hands and his feet were senseless, and he felt his heart turning to ice, and he felt nothing. In a little while the snow began to fall, lightly covering his shoulders. Brother Jasper knew the secret of death at last. The day broke slowly, dim and grey. There was a hurried knocking at the porter's door. A peasant with white and startled face said that the brother was kneeling at the great cross in the snow and would not speak. The monk sallied forth anxiously and came to the silent figure, clasping the cross in supplication. Brother Jasper! The prior touched his hands. They were as cold as ice. He is dead. The villagers crowded round in astonishment, whispering to one another. The monks tried to move him, but his hands, frozen to the cross, prevented them. He died in prayer. He was a saint. But a woman with a paralysed arm came near him, and in her curiosity touched his ragged cowl. Suddenly she felt a warmth pass through her, and the dead arm began to tingle. She cried out in astonishment, and as the people turned to look, she moved the fingers. He has restored my arm, she said. Look! A miracle, they cried out. A miracle! He is a saint! The news spread like fire, and soon they brought a youth lying on a bed, wasted by a mysterious illness, so thin that the bones protruding had formed angry sores on the skin. They touched him with the hem of the monk's garments, and immediately he roused himself. I am whole. Give me to eat. A murmur of wonder passed through the crowd. The monks sank to their knees and prayed. At last they lifted up the dead monk and bore him to the church, but people all round the country crowded to see him. The sick and the paralyzed came from afar, and often went away sound as when they were born. They buried him at last, but still to his tomb they came from all sides, rich and poor, and the wretched monk, who had not faith to cure the disease of his own mind, cured the diseases of those who had faith in him. End of section 5「アラブスクリプトラジオ」「アラブスクリプトラジオ」「アラブスクリプトラジオ」「アラブスクリプトラジオ」「アラブスクリプトラジオ」「アラブスクリプトラジオ」
Orientations by W. Smith at Morn. Section 6. The Choice of Amintas. Part 1. Often enough, the lover of cities tires of their unceasing noise. The din of the traffic buzzes perpetually in his ears, and even in the silences of night he hears the footfalls on the pavement, the dull stamping of horses, the screeching of wheels, the fog chokes up the lungs so that he cannot breathe. He sees no longer any charms in the tall chimneys of the factory and the heavy smoke widening in curves against the leaden sky. Then he flies to countries where the greenness is like cold spring water, where he can hear the butting of the trees and the stars tell him fantastic things. The silence is full of mysterious new emotions. And so the writer sometimes grows weary to death of the life he sees, and he presses his hands before his eyes, that he may hide from him the endless failure in the endless quest then he too set sail for bohemia by the sea and the other countries of the frankly impossible where men are always brave and women ever beautiful there the tears of the morning are followed by laughter at night trials are easily surmountable virtue is always triumphant there no illusions are lost and lovers live ever happily in a world without end once upon a time very long ago when the world was younger and more wicked than it is now there lived in the west country a man called peter the schoolmaster but he was very different from ordinary schoolmasters for he was a scholar and a man of letters he was consequently very poor all his life he had pored over old books and musty parchments but from them he had acquired a little wisdom for one bright springtime he fell in love with a farmer's daughter and married her. The farmer's daughter was a buxom wench, and to the schoolmaster's delight he had a careless, charming soul. She presented him in course of time with a round dozen of sturdy children. Peter compared himself as Priam of Troy, with Jacob, with King Solomon of Israel, and with Queen Anne of England. Peter wrote a Latin ode to each offspring in turn, which he recited to the assembled multitude when the midwife brought into his arms for the first time the new arrival. There was great rejoicing over the birth of every one of the twelve children, but, as was most proper in the land of primogeniture, the chiefest joy was the firstborn, and to him Peter wrote an Arabian ode which was two stanzas longer than the longest Horace ever wrote. Peter vowed that no infant had ever been given the world's greeting in so magnificent a manner. Certainly he had never himself surpassed that first essay, as he told the parson to write twelve odes on paternity. Twelve greetings to the newborn soul is a severe tax even on the most fertile imagination. But the object of all this eloquence was the cause of the first and only quarrel between the gentle schoolmaster and his spouse, for the learned man had dug out of one of his old books the name of Amintas, and Amintas he vowed should be the name of his son, so with that trisyllable he finished every stanza of his ode. His wife threw her head back, and putting her hands on her hips, stood with arms akimbo she said that never in all her born days had she heard of any one being called by such a name which was more fit for a heathen idol than for the plain straightforward member of the church by law established in his stead she suggested that the boy be called peter after his father or john after hers the gentle schoolmaster was in the habit of giving way to his wife in all things, and it may be surmised that this was the reason why the pair had lived in happiest concord. But now he was firm. He said it was impossible to call the boy by any other name than Amintas. The name is necessary to the meter of my ode, he said. It is its very life. How can I finish my stanzas with Petrus or Johannes? I would sooner die. His wife did not think the old method a rap. Peter turned pale with emotion. He could scarcely express himself. Every mother in England has had a child. Children have been born since the days of Cain and Abel, thicker than the sands of the sea. What is a child but an ode? My ode, a child is but an ordinary product of man and woman, but the poem is a divine product of the muses. My poem is sacred. 
it shall not be defiled by any petrus or johannes let my house fall about my head let my household gods be scattered abroad let the face with their serpent's hair render desolate my earth but do not rob me of my verse i would sooner lose the light of my eyes than the light of my verse ah let me wander through the land like homer sightless homeless let me beg my bread from door to door and i will sing the ode the ode to amintas he said all this with so much feeling that mrs peter began to cry and with her apron up to her eyes said that she didn't want him to go blind but even if he did he should never want for she would work herself to the bone to keep him peter waved his hand in tragic deprecation no he would beg his bread from door to door he would sleep by the roadside in the bitter winter night now the parson was present during this colloquy and he proposed an arrangement and finally it was settled that peter should have his way in this case but that mrs peter should have the naming of all subsequent additions to the family so of the rest one was called peter one was called john and there was a mary and a jane and a sarah but the eldest according to agreement was christened amintas although to her dying day notwithstanding the parson's assurances the mother was convinced in her heart of hearts that the name was papistical and not fit for plain straightforward member of the church by law established now it was as clear as the pike staff to peter the schoolmaster that a person called amintas could not go through the world like any other ordinary being so he devoted particular care to his son's education teaching him which was the way of schoolmasters and as now very many entirely useless things and nothing that could be to him of the slightest service in earning his bread and butter but twelve children cannot be brought up on limpid air and there were often difficulties when new boots were wanted sometimes indeed there were difficulties when bread and meat and puddings were wanted such things did not affect peter he fell not to pangs of hunger as he read his books and he vastly preferred to use the white and the yoke of an ape in the restoration of an old leather binding than to have it solemnly cooked and thrust into his belly what cared he for the rentings of his wife and the crying of the children when he could wander in imagination on man's ida clad only in his beauty and the three goddesses came to him promising wonderful things he was a tall lean man with thin white hair and blue eyes but his wrinkled cheeks were still rosy incessant snuff ticking had given a special character to his nose and sometimes ticking upon him the spirit of catullus he wrote verses to lesbia or beneath the breastplate of marcus aurelius he felt his heart beat bravely as he marched against the barbarians he was launcelot and he made charming speeches to guinevere as he kissed her long white hand but now and then the clamour of the outer world became too strong and he had to face seriously the question of his children's appetite it was on one of these occasions that the schoolmaster called his son to his study and said to him amintas you are now eighteen years of age i have taught you all i know and you have profited by my teaching you know greek and latin as well as i do myself you are well acquainted with horace and tally you have read homer and aristotle and at it is you can read the bible in the original hebrew that is to say you have all knowledge at your fingers ends and you are prepared to go forth and conquer the world your mother will make a bundle of your clothes i will give you my blessing in a guinea and you can start to-morrow then he returned to his study of an oration of isocrates i mean to was thunderstruck but father where am i to go the schoolmaster raised his head in surprise looking at his son over the top of his spectacles my son he said with a wave of the arm my son you have the world before you is that not enough yes father said amintas who thought it was a great deal too much but what am i to do i can't get very far on a guinea amintas answered peter rising from his chair with great dignity have you profited so ill by the examples of antiquity 
which you have had placed before you from your earliest years do you not know that riches consist in an equal mind and happiness and golden mediocrity did the wise odysseus quail before the unknown because he had only a guinea in his pocket shame on the heart that doubts leave me my son and make ready amintas very crestfallen left the room and went to his mother to acquaint her with the occurrence she was occupied in the performance of the family's toilet well my boy she said as she scrubbed the face of the last but one it's about time that you set about doing something to earn your living i must say now if instead of learning all this popish stuff about greek and latin and lot knows what you'd learnt to milk a cow or groom a horse you'd be as right as a trifid now well i'll put you up a few things in a bundle as your father said and you can start early tomorrow morning now then darling she added turning to her bedroom come and have your face washed there's a dear amintas scratched his head and presently an inspiration came to him i will go to the parson he said the parson had been hunting and he was sitting in his study in a great oak chair drinking a bottle of pot his huge body and his red face expressed the very completest satisfaction with the world in general one felt that he would go to bed that night with the cheerful happiness of duty performed and snore stentoriously for twelve hours he was troubled by no qualms of conscience the thirty-nine articles caused him never a doubt and it had never occurred to him to concern himself with the condition of the working classes he lived in a golden age when the pauper was allowed to drink himself to death as well as the nobleman and no clergyman's wife read threats by his bedside amintas told his news well my boy he never spoke but he shouted so you're going away well god bless you amintas looked at him expectantly and the parson wondering what he expected came to the conclusion that it was a glass of port for at that moment he was able to imagine nothing that man could desire more he smiled benignly upon amintas and poured him out a glass drink that my boy keep it in your memory it's the finest thing in the world it's port that's made england what she is amintas drank the port but his face did not express due satisfaction damn the boy said the parson pots wasted on him then thinking again what amintas might want he rose slowly from his chair stretching his legs i am not so young as i used to be i get stiff after a day's hunting he walked round his room looking at his bookshelves at last he picked out a book and blew the dust off the edges here's a bible for you amintas the two finest things in the world are port and the bible amintas thanked him but with her great enthusiasm another idea struck the parson and he shouted out another question have you any money amintas told him of the guinea damn your father what's the good of a guinea he went to a drawer and pulled out a handful of gold the tithe had been paid a couple of days before here are ten a man can go to hell on ten guineas thank you very much sir said amintas pocketing the money but i don't think i want to go quite so far just yet then why the devil do you want to go shouted the parson that's just what i came to ask you about why didn't you say so at once i thought you wanted a glass of pot i'd sooner give ten men advice than one man pot he went to the door and called out jane bring me another bottle he drank the bottle in silence while amintas stood before him resting now upon one leg now upon another turning his cap round and round in his hands at last the parson spoke you may look upon a bottle of port in two ways he said you may take it as a symbol of a happy life or as a method of thought there are four glasses in the bottle the first glass is full of expectation you enter life with mingled feelings you cannot tell whether it will be good or no the second glass has the full savour of the grape it is used with vine leaves in its hair and the passion of young blood the third glass is void of emotion it is grave and calm like middle age drink it slowly you are in full possession of yourself and it will not come again 
The fourth glass has the sadness of death and the bitter sweetness of retrospect. He paused a moment for Amintas to weigh his words. But a bottle of port is a better method of thought than any taught by the schoolmen. The first glass is that of contemplation. I think of your case. The second is apprehension. An idea occurs to me. The third is elaboration. I examine the idea and weigh into pros and cons. The fourth is realization. And here, I give you the completed scheme. Look at this letter. It is from my old friend Van Tiefel, a Dutch merchant who lives at Cardiff, asking for an English clerk. One of his ships is sailing from Plymouth next Sunday, and it will put in at Cardiff on the way to Turkey. Amintas thought the project could have been formed without a bottle of port, but he was too discreet to say so, and heartily thanked the parson. The good man lived in a time when teetotalism had not ruined the clergy's nerves, and sanctity was not considered incompatible with a good digestion and common humanity. Amintas spent the evening bidding tender farewells to a round dozen of village beauties, whose susceptible hearts had not been proof against the brown eyes and the dimples of the youth. There was indeed woe when he spread the news of his departure, and all those maiden eyes ran streams of salt tears as he bade them one by one good-bye, and so he squeezed their hands and kissed their lips, vowing them one and all the most unalterable fidelity. They were perfectly inconsolable. It is an interesting fact to notice that the instincts of the true hero are invariably polygamic. It was lucky for Amintas that the parson had given him money, for his father, though he gave him a copy of the Ethics of Aristotle and his blessing, forgot the guinea, and Amintas was too fearful of another reproach to remind him of it. Amintas was up with the lark, and having eaten as largely as he could in his uncertainty of the future, made ready to start the schoolmaster had retired to his study to conceal his agitation he was sitting like agamemnon with dishcloth over his head because he felt his face unable to express his emotion but the boy's mother stood at the cottage door wiping her eyes with the corners of her apron surrounded by her weeping children she threw her arms about her son's neck giving him a loud kiss on either cheek and amintas went the round of his brothers and sisters kissing them and bidding them not forget him to console them he promised to bring back green parrots and golden bracelets and embroidered satins from japan as he passed down the village street he shook hands with the good folk standing at their doors to bid him good-bye, and slowly made his way into the open country. The way of the hero is often very hard, and Amintas felt as if he would choke as he walked slowly along. He looked back at every step, wondering when he would see the old home again. He loitered through the lanes, taking a last farewell of the nooks and corners where he had sat on summer evenings with some fair female friend, and he heartily wished that his name were James or John, and that he were an ordinary farmer's son, who could earn his living without going out for it into the wide, wide world. So may Dick Whittington have meditated as he stretched the London road, but the meantime that no talismanic cats and no church bells rang him inspiring messages. Besides, Dick Whittington had in him from his birth the makings of a Lord Mayor, he had the golden mediocrity which is the surest harbinger of success. But to Amintas the world seemed cold and grey, notwithstanding the sunshine of the morning, and the bare branches of the oak trees were nailed and twisted like the fingers of evil fate. At last it came to the top of a little hill, whence one had the last view of the village. He looked at the red-roofed church nestling among the trees, and in front of the inn he could still see the sigh of the turk's hat a sob burst from him he felt he could not leave it all it would not be so bad if he could see it once more he might go back at night and wander through the streets he could stand outside his own home door and look up at his father's light perhaps seeing his father's shadow bent over his books he cared nothing that his name was amintas 
He would go to the neighbouring farmers and offer his services as a labourer. The village barber wanted an apprentice. Ah, he would ten times sooner be a village Hamden or a songless Milton than any hero. He hid his face in the grass and cried as if his heart were breaking. Presently he cried himself to sleep, and when he awoke, the sun was high in the heavens and he had the very healthiest of appetites. He repaired to a neighbouring inn and ordered bread and cheese and a pot of beer. Oh, mighty is the power of beer! Why am I not a poet, that I may stand with my hair dishevelled, one hand in my many bosom, and the other, outstretched with splendid gesture, to proclaim the excellent beauty of beer? Avaunt, ye sallow teetotlers, ye manufacturers of lemonade, ye cocoa drinkers, you only see the sodden wretch who hangs about the public-house door in filthy slums, blinking his eyes in the glaze of electric light, shivering in his scanty rags, and you do not know the squalor and the terrible despair of hunger which he strives to forget. But above all, you do not know the glorious ale of the country, the golden-brown ale, with its scent of green hops, its broad scent of the country, its foam is whiter than snow and lighter than the almond blossoms, and it is cold, cold. Amintas drank his beer, and he sighed with great content. The sun shone hopefully upon him now, and the birds tweeted all sorts of inspiring things. Still in his mouth was the delightful bitterness of the hops, he threw off care as a mantle, and he stepped forward with joyful heart. Spain was a wild country, the land of the grave Hidalgo and the haughty princess. He felt in his strong right arm the power to fight and kill and conquer. Black-bearded villains should capture beautiful maidens on purpose for him to rescue. Fantifo was but a stepping stone. He was not made for the desk of a counting-house. No heights dazzled him. He saw himself being made a peer or a prince, being granted wider means by a grateful monarch. He was not too low to aspire to the hands of king's fair daughter. He was a hero, every inch a hero. Great is the power of beer. Avant, ye sallow teetotalers, ye manufacturers of lemonade, ye cocoa drinkers. At night he slept on the haystack was the blue sky, star bespangled, for his only roof, and dreams luxurious dreams. The milestones flew past one another as he strode along, two days, three days, four days. On the fifth, as he reached the summit of a little hill, he saw a great expanse of light shining in the distance, and the sea glittered before him, like the bellies of innumerable little silver fishes. He went down the hill, up another, and then saw Plymouth at his feet. The masts of the ships were like a great forest of leafless trees. He thanked his stars, for one's imagination is all very well for a while, and the thought of one's future prowess certainly shortens the time, but roads are hard and hills are steep. One's legs grow tired and one's feet grow sore, and things are not so rose-coloured at the end of a journey as at the beginning. Amintas could not forever keep thinking of beautiful princesses and feats of arms, and after the second day he had exhausted every possible adventure. He had raised himself to the highest possible altitudes, and his aristocratic amours had had the most successful outcome. He sat down by the little stream that ran along the roadside and bathed his aching feet. He washed his face and hands, starting down the hills. He made his way towards the town and entered the gate. Amintas discovered Captain Thorman of the good ship Calderon, drinking rum punch in the tavern pallor. In those days all men were heroic. He gave him the parson's letter. Well, my boy, said the captain, after twice reading it, I don't mind taking you to the Cardiff. I dare say you'll be able to make yourself useful on board. What can you do? Please, sir, answered Amintas, with some pride. I know Latin and Greek. I am well acquainted with Horace and Tully. I have read Homer and Aristotle and edited this. I can read the Bible in the original Hebrew. The captain looked at him. If you talk to me like that, he said, 
I'll shine my glass at your head. He shook with rage, and the redness of his nose emitted lightning sparks of indignation. When he had recovered his speech, he asked Amintas why he stood there like an owl and told him to get on board. Amintas bowed himself meekly out of the room, went down to the harbour, and bearing in mind what he had heard of the extreme wickedness of Plymouth, held tightly on to his money. He had been especially warned against the women who lure the unwary seaman into dark dens and rob him of money and life. But no adventure befell him, thanks chiefly to the swiftness of his heels, for when a young lady of prepossessing appearance came up to him and inquired about his health, affectionately putting her arm in his, he promptly took to his legs and fled. Amintas was in luck's way, for it was not often that an English ship carried merchandise to Spain. As a rule, the two powers were at Decker's drawn, but at this period they had just ceased, cutting one another's throats and sinking one another's ships, joining together in fraternal alliance to cut the throats and sink the ships of a rival power, which, to the treaty, had been a faithful and brotherly ally to his majesty of great britain and which our gracious king had abandoned with unusual dexterity just as he was prepared to abandon him as aminta stood on the deck of the ship and saw the grey cliffs of albion disappear into the sea he felt the emotions and sentiments which inevitably come to the patriotic englishman who leaves his native shore his melancholy became almost unbearable as the ship getting out into the open sea, began to roll, and he drank to the dregs of bitter cup of leaving England, home beauty and terra firma. He went below, and climbing painfully into his hammock, gave himself over to misery and mal de mer. Two days he spent of lamentation and gnashing of teeth, wishing he had never been born, and not till the third day did he come on deck. He was pale and weak, feeling ever so unheroic but the sky was blue and the ship bounded over the blue waves as if it were alive aminta sniffed in the salt air and the rushing winds and felt alive again the days went by the sun became hotter and the sky a different deeper blue while its vault spread itself over the sea in a vast expanse they came in sight of land again they coasted down a gloomy country with lofty cliffs going sheer into the sea. They passed magnificent galleons laden with gold from America. And one morning, when Amintas came on deck at break of day, he saw before him the white walls and red roofs of a southern city. The ship slowly entered the harbour of Cardiff. At last, Amintas went on shore immediately. His spirit was so airy within him that he felt he could hover along in the air, like Mr. Link's spiritualistic butlers, and it was only by a serious effort of will that he walked soberly down the streets like a normal person. His soul shouted with the joy of living. He took in long breath as if to breathe in the novelty and the strangeness. He walked along, too excited to look at things, only conscious of a glare of light and colour a thronging crowd life and joyousness on every side he walked through street after street almost sobbing with delight through narrow alleys down which the sun never fell into big squares hot as ovens and dazzling up hill and down hill past ragged slums past splendid palaces of the rich past shops past taverns Finally he came onto the shore again and threw himself down in the shade of little grove of orange trees to sleep. When he awoke, he saw, standing motionless by his side, a Spanish lady. He looked at her silently, noting her olive skin, her dark and lustrous eyes, the luxuriance of her hair. If she had only possessed a tambourine, she would have been the complete realisation of his dreams. He smiled. Why do you lie here alone, sweet youth? she asked, with an answering smile. And who and what are you? I lay down here to rest later, he replied. I have this day arrived from England, and I'm going to find Tifo, the merchant. Ah, a young English merchant. They are all very rich, are you? Yes, lady. Frankly answered Amintas, pulling out his handful of gold. The Spaniard smiled on him and then sighed deeply. 
why do you sigh he asked ah you english merchants are so fascinating she took his hand and pressed it amyntas was not a forward youth but he had some experience of english maidens and felt that there was but one appropriate rejoinder he kissed her she sighed again as she relinquished herself to his embrace you english merchants are so fascinating and so rich amyntas thought the spanish lady was sent him by the gods for she took him to her house and gave him melons and grapes which being young and of lusty appetite he devoured with great content she gave him wine strong red fiery wine that burned his throat and she gave him sundry other very delightful things which it does not seem necessary to relate End of section six.